Next guest um, jo is Dr. Joanna Young. Um, very small bio. Yeah, humble <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Young is here. <laughs> a renowned botanist and dieback specialist, and a local who lives in Marble Up, but was previously lived amongst the Tingle and Carry Forest of Delgane. Please welcome Dr. Joanna Young. Thank you very much and I'd really like to thank all the people that have gone to so much work to organise this opportunity um, for us all to share some of our knowledge and experiences. I did work in research some 30 years ago before I married my farmer and came to live in Warpole and if I did think about why am I doing this and I thought well I really <laughs> When I got to live in Warpole, it was just a constant delight that here was this amazing conservation estate surrounding a town. And everywhere you went, there was new experiences in terms of such a diverse range of vegetation types and ecological communities. Anyway, I feel you would know that I went on to work in Dieback and established Project Dieback and explored more of the south coast. Anyway, the next slide. Um, I did go back and do some work in planning for the State Conservation Commission, EPA, um, and worked on the Forest Management Plan and the Walpole Wilderness Plan. So I had a background and understanding of what was said about fire management and, its sustain and sustainable programs for um, looking after our conservation estate. But it was probably a couple of years ago that it became evident, well, I really became very concerned about the intensity and scale of prescribed burning and started, I suppose from my forest pathology background, that there seemed to be cumulative effects on many species. It was a degradation of some of those communities I really did truly appreciate it. So just I think to put what I've got to say in context, if you look at a map of the forest management plan area, there is about 2.5 million hectares and of half of that is put aside primarily for the protection of biodiversity. Half the area is open, has been open for logging, mining, um, managed for its timber resource and other uses and about half is actually the conservation estate. And when we look at ecologically sustainable forest management, there is a compromise in terms of what is allowed in what areas, but your conservation estate really this should be in the legislation um, states that these are the areas where we really should be trying to, well, we should be maintaining the biodiversity and managing sustainably. Um, the map there just shows you the amount of prescribed burning that has happened. All the red colour on the map is a fire age or fuel age of naught to four years. These pictures I actually did about six months ago, so the data set will probably be a year out. But in fact, it showed the large areas, especially around Walpole and Denmark down the bottom, that there have been extensive amount and considerable amount of prescribed burning over the last four years as more money had flowed post Margaret River and Yarloop. Um, for prescribed burning. Um, next slide. Um, so I guess I started really looking a bit more into and what I'd known from the management plans. Was it really a sustainable practice? The way it was, um, the way the burns were being cut, conducted over the last few years. You look on the net, you look to the government websites and hazard reduction or prescribed burns I meant to be cool, frequent, with large, uh, with a mosaic which includes unburned patches for refuge for animals, um, 
fire exclusion areas for scientific reference and in the process of there's also extra care given for threatened species. I really feel at the moment, I think well, the reason I'm here, I feel very strongly that many of the outcomes of prescribed burns from sort of this high rainfall area that is experiencing drought um, is far from that many of the areas that values are being degraded. Next slide. So you go on the net, I think the public, I've been to Perth with some of my stories because I really became very concerned about what was happening to the peat systems in particular. And the message I was getting from people in Perth, politicians, etc., is that um, the people wanted. And I think the argument I've been trying to say, yes, it is obvious we have to manage fuel, we've got to prescribe, we have to live with fire. I'm not against prescribed burning, but we have to really think very carefully about how we do it and what outcomes are acceptable if we aren't going to impinge on the many species that Kingsley spoke about. So every picture you see of prescribed burning on a government site will be nice little fires tri trickling in the understory. Next one. Um, I've just drawn on my considerable collection of burnt bush pictures because the burn, prescribed burns are planned usually on the old forest blocks and they all have names and so I tend to when I go push refer to the areas I've been on the forest block names. Um, I guess my moment um, of perhaps this, like it's Dimbarka Dimbarka burn which obviously caused a great amount of smoke and some angst because at the time it was very um, the conditions probably weren't ideal to be burning 10,000 hectares very quickly but my um, come to the next slide it's moved on to be clear was that back in 2017 um, there was a prescribed burn in a block called Thames which has great biodiversity and a great um, amount of peat, etc. And this is, as Warpole locals said to me, this was the day the chickens went to, to roost early. It was a considerable mushroom. Um, this is the kind of scene the day after that mushroom. But on the corner of Thames Block, <coughs> was an area where there'd been a population of the rare and recently discovered sunset frog. And these are the sorts of peat systems. If you read the Warpole Wilderness Plan, it's really one of the unique things about the high rainfall zone of the southwest, that forest, not, the great, um, the importance of these peat systems. This is what they meant to look like. But after the, in recent years, because it's been so dry, usually when there's prescribed burns and aerial ignition, they're lighting and they're burning and many of them are burning and smouldering and very, very difficult to put out. Next. Um, so I'm just running through a few examples. They are horror pictures, but I tell you, they're not far, it's not, there are a lot of burns that have been very hot and very damaging over the last few years. Out on Poison Hill on the coast, there was a noise burn in some of the coastal um, communities just west of Warpole. Um, this wasn't meant to be burnt but it escaped from the prescribed burn. There was a mainland, can you keep just rolling a bit quicker? Um, these sort of scenes are the prescribed burns but in fact the final result is basically a bit like a wildfire. They're very hot. Um, on this site there was a colony of mainland quokkas. We found six dead in 150 metres of walking and very rare Banksia verticillata was probably one of the most healthy populations and it, they had been killed. Then we went to Pinger up, another prescribed burn. This is the kind of country, aerial ignition, large area, burned out quickly. Look on Google Earth, there was a few little patches of canopy left but all the moisture mosaic, all the moisture country, everything was burned. I walked into some of those little knobs of carry that appeared green from Google Earth. 
but most of the understory, the fire had run under those forests. Um, so then Phil's talked about Dembarka. Um, it's the area of Crown Scorch is just really concerning. It takes a long time for these trees to rebuild their crowns, flower again, support anything like a population of um, cockatoos. They're hot fires, but when we look the, to the future planning, if we're going to have these areas burn on something like a six, eight year rotation, it'll take a much longer time for these areas burnt so hot to recover. Um, but you might say, well, the Dembarka fire was unfortunate. They probably started edging it. The forecast got worse. Um, they had to go ahead. There's real problem with burn security. People fear, fearful of an escape. So they went for hard and far. they bombed it. There was a say, aerial ignition pattern, bombed out pretty quickly. And that might have been, well, yeah, it was unfortunate, the forecast. A little bit later, like on the 27th of November, a couple of weeks later, another area was burnt, 6,000 hectares of Pirilup, south of um, Padalup, right up on the north. It's hot, it's dry, we bomb it out and probably get some sort of contribute to the 30,000 hectares that probably needed to be burnt in the um, Franklin district so that those managers would reach, you know, be able to contribute to this 200,000 hectare annual target. So what's at stake if we cook the bush hot and often? This is, I think, the, this is what has motivated me, I suppose, to come. There's many species, such as Kingsley's talked about, this habitat for a lot of species that are probably not been, they're really exposed now because we've had such an incredibly dry period. Old growth um, forest elements, obviously the nectar and all the things that sustains many vertebrates and invertebrates. Strong populations of many of our fire sensitive endemics. These are listed in the corporate literature and assets for ecotourism. And I'll just try and run through these next slides really quickly. Um, Oh, dead quokkas, they need, they need unburned uh, riparian zones and dense thickets they will graze in. Um, this is an area where a population of the sunset frog, the habitat has now been destroyed because it was burnt. Um, this is Tingle Forest near our farm in Walpole. I used to walk along this road and over the time it's been repeatedly burnt. Well, many of the big trees have fallen and when you hear after a burn, the hollow butts get on light and if you don't need to walk after a burn and even if it looks relatively mild, you'll hear some of the big trees crashing. Um, as I say, I'm really worried that part of the problem that we're not getting a mosaics at the moment is that the landscapes are so dry and there's so little moisture. Our main creek through our Walpole farm has gone dry this year for the first time ever. So this is contributing to the problems the managers have of not being able to get a mosaic of um, fire intensity across these 10,000 hectare blocks. Uh, the, the last pick, oh, it doesn't matter. The red flowering gum and the both 40 are red flowering gum community, which is your iconic species as a forest pathologist or you know, not a bit of it, is that in the wild, many of these are now really struggling to survive. That's, people mightn't realise you burn out there and say, no, the trees are coming back after the last burn. But if that's a row, a row of red flowering gums, um, some years after a prescribed burn. But these things, these systems were wetter, they were moister, and here we are in a time of drought. Um, Redmond, the paperbacks, it's all these communities that were wetter, they're really dry now. So I guess one of the things I feel is that we should back off in terms of how much area, how, you know, that we have to have a bit more variation from year to year and to be burning large areas fast when it's so dry, we obviously go to impact on systems that are really stressed. Um, Kingsley's talked about the obligate receders, the things like the um, 
Banksy Quisfolia, next they killed by fire. And when I went out looking up at Pirilup, I really found this interesting area where there was a lot of uh, native pine or acolytris, and they were mostly burnt, not coming back after the last time. And the only place that was surviving was along a roadside. And I thought, I wonder if anyone really was aware that here we had a concentration of another community type in one of the my, most biodiverse areas of the Walpole Wilderness, but they have just been treated like everything else and basically burnt. Um, so why the, uns oh, why the, the unsatisfactory outcomes? I sort of analysed this a bit. Why is this happening on this scale? Why isn't there a bit more caution? How can we do it better? Um, the climate change is dry. Cost. One of the things that the deep oil reports on each year is the cost per hectare to burn. Um, the other thing is I feel very much for the managers that are having to make decisions in terms of if we leave mosaics and patches unburnt, there's a possibility they'll reignite if we get bad weather and spread. So that is a really pulling against. There's no incentive to leave patches unburnt, which is so critical for a fauna. Um, and this area target, there's some confusion about that, but the 200,000 hectare target is for the forest management plan area, which is only this 2 million hectares and half of it is um, open for logging and mining, etc. People don't realise just how dry it's got down here so quickly. I mean, I wrote some letters about, so I was so concerned about these peat systems, which are so iconic in the Walpole wilderness. And I mean, Roger wrote back and said, no, peat soils don't ignite. They ignite because we've never seen some of these profiles so dry. Um, cost per hectare really worries me because if you want to burn and come in at a target, something like $15 a hectare to burn, you haven't got a lot of options. You're going to actually, the only way to do it is to do big slabs of country fast. And that is the Dembarkas, the Pirilups and um, the Pingarups. That'll give you plenty of hectares and that's cheap. But if you've got to come in and start protecting close to the town and do more intensive management, well, how much do you pay um, a good young environmental scientist to do the planning, how much do you pay the contractor to do the, you know, scrub rolling and the fire breaks. You're not going to do much burning for $15 a hectare close to town. Next. Um, but you do it this way and it'll be cheaper. But we're actually going to have a lasting serious impact on many species of our conservation estate. So I make the conclusion, um, broad scale prescribed burning in times of drought heightens all kinds of risks. Um, I really believe the conservation estate is currently taking the brunt of the policy, the, the brunt of the current policy. And I don't think the government, we think that we collectively have to try to communicate to government that the good people of the nature conservation branch in Depor and whatever, we actually have to spend a bit more on looking after our biodiversity and not just burning it. Some of the burning budget probably should go to better in planning and more resources to actually identify some of these things like the colitra stands and actually try to excise some of this stuff from burning. So just to, to actually also reiterate my point, and this, I can finish on this, is to say that the conservation of the state is taking the brunt of the current policy to prescribe burn. We don't mention blue gums much, but they've been mentioned a bit on Kinkaroo Island because people felt once it came out of the park and fire got into the blue gums, whoosh, she really went. Um, we've got blue gums planted between our farm and the town in Walpole and I look at them and think, well, is anyone worried about the fuel load in there? Because it's pretty high. Um, the tingle forest is actually the problem. We've got to prescribe burn the tingle forest regularly, even if the big trees fall down. Um, but anyway, if we look at the Warren region and we look at the red colour under 10 years fuel age, you'll probably see that the, where it's all red down here, that's basically the Walpole wilderness. Where you've got over 10 years, 
You've got areas around Pemberton and Manjima. The state forest, there's a lot of regrowth carry. There's Jarrah's been logged, a lot of production areas. So in fact, this blanket prescription of we must burn 200,000 hectares of the forest management plan area, um, and we've got a cost per hectare KPI. If you get the wrong KPIs, you'll get the wrong outcomes if you're not really honest about what you're trying to do. Um, and I think I've probably run over time, so at that point I'll stop.